All right, so let's play a little bit. Oh, you let me get it. I'm it's, gonna try to stab it? Yes. Obviously, it's not deflating. This and is weirdly it, satisfying. And give it a bounce. <laughs> it's still... Wow. What if somebody ran it over? Still be fine? It'll go flat and then reinflate itself. And every little hole you see here represents a ball that's not in the trash, and every little hole you see represents between five and $50 you just saved to replace it. When you're in the middle of Africa or Afghanistan, <laughs> where you can't just run down to the store and get another ball, this is a lifesaver. First of all, how in the world did this happen? It started with me watching a news story about the plight of children in Darfur and other war zones. They were explaining that the only therapy that works is for children to play, but they have nothing to play with. Because the environment is so sharp-edged, uh, it's not idealized like a grass field. They live in environments where there's amazing thorns, there's barbed wire, broken glass, all that. And the average lifespan of an inflated traditional ball in those environments is about an hour. An hour? An hour. This has been road tested even by a lion? Yes, it has. When we launched uh, in Johannesburg at the World Cup in 2010, we had this bright idea that we would go to a zoo and they said, we have this lion that loves to play with balls. And Triton, this beautiful, mature male, he saw the ball coming and he perked up. He's so ready to play. He played for over an hour and then finally laid down from exhaustion. Even after three days, they could not believe it. It's got huge punctures in it, but it's still bouncing and playing. How critical was Sting's involvement in all this? It was as profound as having the vision in the first place. It was his understanding in less than 30 seconds how important this ball was. I mean, he knew how important it was before I could even tell him and said, do it now and I will help you with that. It just speaks to the kind of person that he is, and he and his wife, they are genuinely committed to everything that they believe in. It's very important for our entire team to have the opportunity to go and actually see what the impact is. It's one thing to hear about it and see the, the photos and video, and it's even another thing to see it firsthand. I think this whole idea of bringing soccer as global language, it brings all people together. I think it's a great undertaking and it's definitely been a benefit to our school to have these available for the kids for the lessons as well. In a way, are you going to be victims of your own success? Because if something is so durable, that means you only need to buy one. How do you make this commercially viable given the fact that this thing lasts forever? When we look at it as an essential tool for children who are 12 and under who live in abject poverty, war zones, disaster areas, and refugee camps situations, including right here in our great country. When you add in youth and teenagers and young adults to 25, you get to two and a half billion human beings who require a ball that's that durable so that they can have social cohesion and, and have thoughts for hope in the future. It turns out to be the single largest ball donation in history. Even at two million balls a year, after 100 years, we would not have reached 10% of the people who need it who don't just use it as a luxury or a recreational tool. Research shows again and again that play is one of the few forms of activity or therapy that actually helps people recover from traumatic situations. So when children are in refugee camps or recovering from natural disasters, communities that are in recovery, the opportunity for play is vital to that community's recovery. You guys operate under the whole principle of buy one, give one, the Warby Parker, if you will, of balls. <laughs> How does that work? Because I know this is not a nonprofit. Well, we have the privilege of being one of the early adopters of the B Corporation model. It's a triple bottom line of people, planet, profit. It's about doing well and doing good at the same time. It's not philanthropy and it's not charity. It's a very different proposition that I think the early days of the actual technical language is still coming, emerging, and uh, we're privileged to be part of developing that. So there's a, a growing group of mission-driven businesses out there, and we 
We know most of them and we're proud to work with. For example, uh, Tom Shoes, they sell our ball on their website and we share giving opportunities. We always have campaigns on our website where either you can select to have the ball go to a particular campaign, which would be certain countries, or you can also just leave it up to us. Tell us a little bit about how many balls you've distributed, how many countries uh, these balls can currently be found. We have to date distributed over 850,000 balls. We're already in 167 countries. We're shipping about 50,000 balls a month currently. So, how has this changed your lives? It's been an incredible journey, an incredibly profound experience and an honor and humbling. As much joy as this is, it tested us in every area of our lives, but it's absolutely worth it.